Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to just take a minute to let a few more folks kind of join into the session, but we'll get started in a couple minutes. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today here at the first Bullet History of Medicine Club lecture for this fall. I'm Josh DeHoyer. I'm one of the medical student co-leaders here at UNC School of Medicine. And I'm grateful to have such, to host such a wonderful lecture lined up today. Today's lecture is Mind, Body, Medicine and Black Women's Clubs in the Era of Jim Crow. And it will be presented by Carrie Streeter. A little housekeeping before we get started today. We will host a Q&A session at the end and please submit your questions in a QA, Q and A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. This lecture will be recorded and will be made available later this week on the Bullet History of Medicine Club website. Carrie Streeter, today's speaker, is a PhD candidate at the University of California, San Diego, specializing in US histories of health and gender and race. In 2012, she completed a master's in public history at Appalachian State University, where she also currently teaches. Her research focuses on the history of mental health care, broadly conceptualized. After writing a master's thesis on the progressive era development of Brown Hospital, North Carolina's second state mental hospital, she began researching therapeutics in a different venue, the parlors and schools of the late 1800s, where American women popularized exercises we would recognize today as mind-body medicine. Today's presentation draws from that research and is part of her forthcoming dissertation, Wings to Their Heels, Self-Expression, and health and the rise of the new woman. We are honored to have us here. We are honored to have her with us here today. I will now turn the microphone over to it. Thank you, Joshua. And thank you for inviting me um, to present this research with y'all. It's been, I, I'm often um, presenting this to US historians or dance historians, and um, it's a real treat to be in conversation with medical students and um, and medical professors. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and just uh, launch on in. I'll share my screen here, I think. Okay, hopefully we're there. Um, I added a little, a little extra word to, or a couple words to the title, breathing power, um, which is something that women are actually doing in these practices, cultivating breathing power and also engaging the power of breath in projects of social activism in this period. Um, and so before diving into uh, 
the, the lecture, I wanted to give you a little experiment, something that I usually do in a, in a room full of folks, but something that I thought we could all just be doing out in our own Zoom world. So um, if you're in a place where you can actually move your body and stand up, do this, or you can even just imagine what you might do. If I first ask you to put your body in the pose of revenge, um, how might your body express revenge? And so usually in the room, I would, everyone would do this with their eyes closed. We'd open our eyes and we'd look around and we'd probably notice that a lot of us look something like this, <laughs> right? Arm up, um, a gesture of revenge. Okay, next one, exhaustion. When I say the emotion of exhaustion, what does your body do? And if we were to look around, we might, we might all draw in, you know, look like we're about ready to nap. Uh, the next one I'd have you as experiment with is since it's October, we'll try horror. <laughs> um, and here's a depiction of that. And the last one that I would have us try is uh, my favorite, my personal favorite, which is sauciness. <laughs> Um, and it's a little, it's definitely a very 19th century term, but if you imagine your body in the pose of sauciness, what might happen? Here's this depiction of sauciness. Don't care. Oftentimes a hip gets kind of cocked. So um, as you can imagine in this, this period, these are this, um, this uh, generation's power poses, <laughs> right? Um, and some of you may have seen this uh, TED talk by Amy Cuddy in 2010. I think it was like the most watched TED talk of all time or second watched or something like this. And it seemed to be a really revolutionary um, social psychology kind of approach to cultivating confidence that was connected with all sorts of kind of markers of health and wellness. Um, and then it got really became really problematic when the science, right, the science didn't couldn't quite replicate um, the findings of these studies. Um, but so the currently, though, um, I find it interesting, right, this question of science persists with this modality of mind body medicine, how do we prove something that people seem to have a positive effect with and just as recently as last year, um, the Association for Psychological Science came out and said, you know, postural expansiveness versus contractiveness does indeed make people feel more powerful. The effect isn't huge, of course, but it's clearly there. This is something that I absolutely engage in my, um, my dissertation work, uh, the title of which, whoops, there we go, um, Josh wrote or read, Wings to Their Heels, Self-Expression and Health, and the Rise of the New Woman. Um, one of the, the title, Wings to Their Heels, actually comes from uh, this statue of the flying mercury. A very common prescription that women would give um, through this work was, um, when one feels a case of the blues coming on, instead of for giving into vague forebodings, she would put herself into the pose of the flying mercury, this pose right here, right? The blues would take wings to their heels and fly away, referencing the wings of the flying mercury. So we can see um, in that prescription, right, for something like melancholy or what we might call depression, right, um, that there's this power of a pose um, to affect your mood and to improve your health. Um, and really this study takes us into the very complicated world of therapeutics themselves. And I think it's a good thing to bring in um, Charles Rosenberg's comments, enduring valuable comments on this matter of therapeutics, right? Therapeutics involve emotions and personal relationships, and they incorporate all of those cultural factors which determine belief, identity, and status. And um, as Joshua mentioned, I, I did begin this study really in the mental hospitals of North Carolina in the progressive era. I spent two years with those records exploring the development of therapeutics in this ascendant period of biomedical authority. And um, after that work, I really I had questions about therapeutics that might have been authorized outside of those spaces um, and that may have also had an enduring influence on American culture. Um, and that seemed to also be quite entangled with questions of belief, identity, and status. 
And indeed, the therapeutics I'll be telling you about today are really the behind the scenes embodied practices of the women's movement of this period. Um, the women that are uh, doing these iconic suffrage parades in the 1913 and 1913 and throughout this period would have been practicing these exercises um, in preparation for performances like this, that where they're part of a regular culture in schools and society clubs. And just as um, these movements, the women's movement was very deliberately white and often um, excluded black women, our purview and our understanding of these therapeutics has also often erased um, black women from these uh, settings. Um, and so I want the, to talk, the talk today will focus a bit more on those questions of race and how those questions, how that dynamic informs both our understanding of mind-body medicine writ large, but also in this period. Um, because indeed, though we might, though Black women were putting forward images like this in their newspapers, um, this fabulous um, kind of Wonder Woman of her own, right? This comes from an Indianapolis newspaper in 1890s. Um, larger society was, it was very common to depict such women that were interested in these movements in this way, right? In very derogatory terms, they, they are not, uh, they're not proud new women, right? Um, where these kinds of images are drawing um, on very longstanding racist stereotypes. Um, and of course, so, you know, the club, what this is situated in the club women movement, um, which is something that's happening in both black and white communities um, in the years after the Civil War, really kind of, there's a start in 1869 with the establishment of suffrage organizations. And by the 1890s, you have um, alliances of local um, women's clubs, um, you know, making national and international alliances even. Um, and I find this statement from Fanny Barrier Williams um, quite provocative when she's looking back over kind of a decade of organizing in these communities, um, she will characterize this work, right, as um, something as something which is nothing less than organized anxiety. And of course, she's often speaking there to, you know, the very formation of the clubs themselves. Um, uh, and the work that they're doing to address racial dis you know, uh, disparities, the rise of violence um, in their communities, they're speaking out against lynching, um, they're organizing to build healthcare facilities in their communities. Um, and I think that all of that goes into the statement that what they were doing was nothing less than organized anxiety in the face of really stressful times, right? But there's also really tactics that they're doing um, that privilege their wellness. Um, historian Martha Jones, when she describes um, Black women's club movement says they deliberated, they created um, tactics and strategies to sustain communal well-being and enhance their standing in broader society. Um, other Black his women historians have described the work of Black club women as um, fulfilling what psychiatrists today call self-actualization, um, that they, the work in, according to another historian, Erlene Ferguson, was to reclaim Black women's pride, dignity, and self-esteem, and to construct psychological bulwarks against the larger society's best efforts to define them as inferior, immoral, and therefore unworthy or marginal human beings. And so my research really um, builds, across, builds upon these, this broad, um, magnificent scholarship of Black club women's movements, but it also adds to it an understanding of one of the specific kind of embodied ways in which they are organizing their anxiety and promoting wellness. And we're gonna look at that today in particular in, in the community of Indianapolis at the turn of the 20th, 20th century. So we'll be traveling back in time there. That is where this newspaper, um, um, uh, The Freeman was published. It was one of the very popular colored newspapers of the period, highly illustrated. And it's just was wonderful to find um, this illustration of a black woman dressed in a Grecian robe with emblazoned justice um, on her crown there um, as the header for their public opinion column. So this iconography, as we'll see, was something um, that wasn't just in newspapers. It was also being embodied in real life. Um, and it was part of um, kind of uh, 
fortifying themselves for what they might encounter in a, a city that was becoming um, increasingly hostile to their to their lives, really. So just to place us um, in Indianapolis's population, the city itself is experiencing quite significant growth in this period, um, as the, with the rise of industrialization. Um, and, and kind of just um, a movement to cities in general um, in this period of time. And this um, kind of orange line here represents the, the growing black population of the city. It always um, maintained about 10% of the whole population. Um, and of course, a lot of the black people moving to Indianapolis were fleeing um, Southern states, many of them, um, where they were facing the rise of Jim Crow violence. Um, and oppression there. And so just to place us even legally in this period of time, right? 1896 is Plessy versus Ferguson, which makes the kind of growing practices of segregation legal. Um, and then by the 1920s in Indianapolis even, you have largely the KKK in running the city politics. So what we see black women creating here um, in this period is a response to, to changing circumstances in their city um, that are becoming um, a city that's becoming very hostile to their presence. So our guides, um, our guides through uh, what we're going to explore are, are the women themselves. And I'll just introduce some of them. Um, I've spent a lot of time learning about these women. And so I'll have to really um, exercise some um, discipline here to not just go on and on and on about their fabulous lives. But kind of our first and foremost guide is a woman named Lillian Thomas Fox. Um, she studied elocution with this woman, Harriet Prunk. Um, in Indianapolis. And Lillian Thomas Fox will actually become the first black journalist hired by a white newspaper to run her own column. Um, she does that in 1900 um, and she retires in 1917. Um, she's a voice for the black community of Indianapolis. She persistently puts their lives and the photographs of them and their, their comings and goings um, in the columns in the, in the white newspapers in the city. Um, she also forms the, for the Black Women's Clubs of, or I should say, she forms um, uh, some of the prominent Black Women's Clubs of Indianapolis and also is the leader from Indiana in a national alliance of Black Women's Clubs. So she's incredibly influential. Um, in that work, she would also work with another hugely influential woman to the women's rights movement writ large, May Wright Sewell. She's an educator in Indianapolis. Um, she runs a women's school that's a preparatory college for um, women to go to places like Wellesley and Harvard and all of that. Um, she is also a leader on the international stage of the women's rights movement. And notably, when Black women join some of these um, national organizations and Southern women protest their presence, May Wright Sewell is one of them that intervenes and absolutely makes sure that Black women are invited to those um, women's clubs, the national women's clubs. Um, she also speaks in Black organizations um, throughout this period. So she plays a very interesting and important role in um, the women's movement in Indianapolis. Um, Lily and Thomas Fox will also work really closely um, with several other Black women in her community, and some of them that I'll refer to today. Dr. Beulah Porter, the first Black woman in Indianapolis to get a medical degree. I think that happens in 1896. Um, I'm not 100% sure, uh, can pin all the details down, but I think um, running and you know, having a profession as a, as a Black physician, female physician, was um, not the easiest route for her probably at the time. And she ends up becoming a, a school teacher and a principal and we'll encounter some of her work a little bit later. And then um, Lillian Thomas Fox is also reporting on the important work of Daisy D. Walker who herself was an elocutionist um, and a social worker. Um, and she's running an important settlement home in, um, in Indianapolis. She also taught for a while at the Tuskegee Institute. Um, you may be familiar with that with Booker T. Washington. Um, and she's, she's a dynamo. 
So um, these will be our guides um, to the exercises and to the health culture I'll be talking about. And I actually just like to imagine if we could be at a, in a room with them, you know, if we could have dinner with these women and we asked them what activities in, co in your community benefited women's health, they would answer <laughs> classes of psychophysical culture. That's the term, that's one of the terms of the kinds of practices that um, go by a lot of different names in this, in this period. But these exercises and these kinds of classes would have been at the top of their list. They're all doing these exercises or promoting them in their community. And they are, um, they are an exercise that importantly crosses color lines. So I'll be talking more about this particular image and this club, this was known as the Flanner Guild Del Sartre Club. Um, and I wanted to just point out that it is something that Lillian Thomas Fox makes sure appears in the white newspaper where she was at the, the, one of the head columnists for the black community, as well as the black newspaper. So it is a discipline or an activity that importantly crosses the color line um, in black and white communities. Um, and I want, before I explain what this is and what they're doing, um, I thought I might tell you a little bit more why they're calling this Del Sart. You may have heard of Del Sart, um, but more it's likely that you haven't. Um, so Francois Del Sart was a Frenchman, actually. Um, he was a trainer of actors. He never came to the United States. He died in 1871, um, but American elocutionists and actors are really drawn to his, um, what they call science of expression. And they believe he discovered laws of expression. Um, two of the most popular laws were the law of correspondence, to each spiritual function responds a function of the body, to each grand function of the body corresponds a spiritual act. So you can hear in that, right? A mind body correspondence. And then the other popular law of expression among Americans was this law of control. It said strength at the center, freedom at the surface. Now, American women largely are responsible for taking these laws and applying them to exercises um, and, and really to popularizing and publishing the manuals by, that will explain these laws of expression and also illustrate them. So what you're seeing here is from the manual of Genevieve Stebbins, um, the first kind of textbook of Del Sardism. And as you, could, as you might imagine right here, we have kind of graphing out um, body language and trying to um, explain and establish that correspondence between mind and body gesture and emotion. Um, it's, there's so much more to just the story of Dilsart and the way that American women embrace this science, this claim to science, right? But the thing that I would encourage you to take away from what I'll be talking about today is that even though largely actually most of what American women are doing under the name Dilsart is nothing the Frenchman ever taught. Um, the, the moniker Delsart is really functioning in a um, crucial way for them. It's a shorthand way of saying that what they were doing was scientifically verified um, and that that had implications, um, social implications for them. I will also just place this kind of in the broader development of, um, um, of understanding emotion itself. In its time period, Americans would um, many prominent Americans would make connections between what Del Sartre had um, expressed and Charles Darwin's findings on the expression of the emotions in man and animal. In fact, the two theories come to America at this, basically the same time. And some people would say Del Sartre is Darwin applied. So there's a lot more to this, but I do want to just mark it for you to also let you know, right, that this interest in this emotion, um, scientific emotion is emerging from um, the world of elocution, which is about speaking and gesture, right? And they're seeing in this science, as I said, a tool for challenging restrictive norms. For women, that might mean, you know, being kind of small, small gestures um, considered feminine. They're looking for kind of broadening um, what's considered an acceptable range of expression. Um, and here's an advertisement for um, Harriet Prunk's School of Expression there in Indianapolis. Um, 
those claims that the, these laws, uh, this idea that there was a universality to the association between emotion and gesture is really crucial for women, um, black and white women in this period, right? And this is one of the elocutionists, um, Hallie Q. Brown is a really important teacher and elocutionist of this period. And she will describe the value in this way. She'll say, you know, Francois Delsart's universal formula for understanding the immutable unity of mind, body, and soul really proves that all humans, regardless of upbringing or heredity, were capable of cultivating what they're calling self-possession. Right, so you can hear in the way that she's claiming um, and using this science of expression for purposes of kind of resisting and challenging um, a lot of racist depictions of Black Americans. Okay. Um, even in its time, I wanted to point out, um, you know, I think when we ask why we haven't heard of this, uh, I'm going to say it now so I don't forget to say it later. But I would say one of the reasons why this movement, even though it was hugely influential in this period, maybe doesn't make it into our histories of medicine, not even really into our histories of what we call alternative or complementary medicine. Um, I think we can understand that in terms of it wasn't combative. They're not, um, they're not um, kind of fighting with, uh, they're not in the same contest for medical authority um, in this period. They're largely, um, their work is largely understood as complementary. Um, and it's happening in the home and it's happening in schools. So William James is one of the promoters, right? The father of American psychology sees um, in what's going on with this emergence of Delsartism, something very similar to his own theories of emotion. They're actually emerging at the same time. And, and his, he, his, um, his friend, one of his friends or associates is Annie Payson Call, who becomes, identifies herself as a nerve trainer. She certainly studied Delsartism and she's authorizing really popular manuals like The Power of Repose. Well, William James gives this a, an endorsement in this period, right? In his talk, The Gospel of Relaxation, which he gave in 1896 to the Boston Normal School of Gymnastics, he says, you know, power through repose by Annie Pace and Call ought to be in the hands of every teacher and student in America of either sex. So he's a huge endor, he gives these, um, Therapeutics, a big endorsement. And he also actually attends the class of Emily Bishop here at the Chautauqua Institute in New York in 1896. She's also another hugely influential teacher of these practices and um, publishes manuals. And he says to her after attending her class, Madame, you are teaching what I am preaching, which of course is that reference again to, he had just lectured um, the gospel of relaxation. Um, and so, you know, these therapeutics, I put this up here to, to help us understand um, how widespread um, these therapeutics were and how very local they were too, right? They're, it's an exercise, it's a therapeutic that relies upon um, repeated practices. And so um, they're making a lot of, um, they're taking up space literally in homes, parlors, and community centers in this period of time. So what exactly are they practicing? Um, I think the visuals, you know, picture is worth a thousand words as they say. So here's some photographs of the types of things. Uh, if you went to a class that was um, called Del Sart, um, it might get be called Del Sart. It also might be called that bigger name, psychophysical culture. Um, you would begin with movements that loosened your tension. Um, loosen tension in your body. So the common one of shaking your hands is a really um, kind of common um, beginning exercise. You also um, will see in a lot of manuals an instruction for something like this, right? Where you're bending over and releasing tension in your body. So you're beginning a class, right? Um, with that point of kind of loosening this tension. And next, you would do breathing exercises. Now, a lot of these were deliberately um, addressing issues of respiratory health. Um, they, and if you think about it, if you're, if you're an elocution teacher and you're interested um, in, in having a voice that you don't lose after speaking a while, breathing exercises are really central to that. Um, and so these exercises are meant to strengthen one's voice, but as I will reference a little bit more later too, 
they're also um, addressing the most prevalent uh, warning signs of tuberculosis or consumption, right? So shortness of breath and a sunken or a mobile chest and a kind of torpid constitution. Um, so this was a benefit that they saw of these types of practices. Um, they're doing like this tapping exercise, you know, they're doing breathing in association with movement of the arms. And these really are actually exercises that emerge um, in American culture in earlier parts of the 19th century in the health reform movements of the antebellum era um, that are in, in a, a period of time in which um, exercise as health is really understood as a really progressive um, therapeutic option um, for young medical professionals. Um, and so some of the women that are actually um, popularizing the things called del Sart or psychophysical culture had actually taken time to study with some of those physicians um, in the 1880s. Um, by this point, those physicians are quite old, <laughs> but they're drawing from their work and they're kind of continuing its um, its popularity in their own in their in their own ways. Of course, the other the other really iconic um, practice of a del Sart class was this one, um, which was to simply lie down um, and in this breathing position and do a sequence. There was lots of different types of instructions, but essentially this is another one for relaxation of nervous tension. Um, it's also the, the instructions frequently will ask um, someone to, you know, let their body feel heavy. Um, they'll visualize breathing in through their feet and through their head and all this. So it's kind of a long sequence of different kinds of things to do with the breath while lying down. And in terms of physical culture and um, kind of physical education in this period, this emphasis on relaxation is quite um, distinctive um, in what becomes known as del Sartre. As you can imagine, this is a very different type of class than um, basketball or football or something like that. Of course, women are not doing football, but they are starting to do basketball in this period. Um, next, um, after these relaxation practices, uh, women would have moved through what kind of a very slow paced strengthening movements. So you can imagine your body and maybe you've even done some of these movements yourself, um, right? They're trying to build that core, like literally in the, in the muscular um, uh, systems of the body, but he, there's also an understanding of, right, kind of the emotional benefit. Um, in these uh, um, exercises, we see uh, that Del Sartre law that they would have said, the, the law of control, strength at the center, freedom at the surface. And lastly, and another really kind of, um, actually two more examples of what they're doing in these classes. Um, they're exploring a range of emotions with Grecian statuary as their guides. And this is just one example of some pages um, from a, one of these Del Sartre recitation books that has all these Grecian statues in it. Um, this becomes incredibly iconic. You can't, uh, you'll see in, in the visual culture of this period, um, women all over the United States putting on Grecian styled robes and doing these kind of tableau scenes. Um, well, what's going on with that, right? Um, why are they referencing the value of Grecian iconography? So just in some ways like, and this is, I will say a total American invention of American del Sartism, um, Francois del Sart, the Frenchman, certainly never did these types of practices. Um, part of what you see here is that ish way of um, claiming a common aesthetic, a revered aesthetic in order to um, intervene and broaden what is understood as an acceptable feminine display of emotion. So it wasn't uncommon in this period for women to be encouraged to be small, right? To not that there were actual, um, in the elocution world in particular, there were gestures that were considered only appropriate for men. They're the large kind of defiant gestures. And so um, referencing Grecian iconography is kind of this permission slip for women to try something different and also um, make a claim that it is aesthetically um, valid, right? It's also, of course, drawing on, um, you, can't, you kind of can't go anywhere in American political culture without references to ancient Greece, right? Um, this is a, a, a drawing from 1815 
um, and where we have American guided by wisdom and we have, you know, Minerva like characters, um, there's, a, there's a strong association and esteem for the uh, aesthetics of ancient Greece. And of course, this is also present in those earlier health reform movements, right? A very common encouragement for women to get out of corsets, for example, is to compare um, the effects of corsetry to the natural waste of like a Venus de Milo. Um, and so all of these references are also in play in what in the Grecian iconic, Grecian statue posing practices um, that are understood to be good for women's health in this period. And they're doing something a little bit more than, um, than just kind of standing in a static pose um, in, these in these practices of American Delsart. They're also um, innovating what will eventually become, um, they'll call it a drill. Um, and sometimes they'll also call it a dance. But because um, dance could um, be seen as immoral in this way, um, they're kind of playing in that zone of trying to get approval for practices that right, are kind of maybe a little more sensuous. But this is one of the popular drills like that the Flanner Guild Del Sart Club in Indianapolis could have done. They would have started their drill um, taking the pose of Diana here, um, then moving on to the fighting gladiator then a, a defensive, uh, a defending gladiator here, and then ending with this very triumphant pose, um, the winged victory, um, where each woman actually would have raised her arms overhead and done that practice, right, of drawing strength in her center and marching forward. They would kind of, you read the instructions for these dr drills and they're just kind of, you know, triumphantly marching with their arms overhead. Um, they, from these kinds of drills, they would also move into what would be recognized more as, as dance. And they're actually taking inspiration from this kind of um, visual display that is on items of antiquity. And indeed, I just want to point out here, so one of the pri primary promoters of Del Sardism, um, I showed her manual earlier, is Genevieve Stebbins here on the left. Um, she's really a dance innovator and she's an inspiration to the women that um, make such dances far more um, iconograph or become icons of this kind of dance. You may have heard of Isadora Duncan. Um, she's one of them that grows up um, having learned and been in, exposed to um, the popularity of what gets known as American Del Sardism. Um, and you can kind of see right there in her gesture, the references to the Grecian iconography and also that breaking free kind of gesture. So even within the history of dance, and I should say dance historians are like the first scholars that really um, write about the period of American Delsartism, the, the most formative scholarship emerges from that, from, from that field of study. Um, even within that field of study, we've long not thought <laughs> that African American women were participating in these types of dances. And of course they were. Um, the visual evidence is just a little harder to find. But I think this picture says more than a thousand words. Um, this is one of those types of dances and it's taking place at Hampton Institute, um, which is a really influential black college in Hampton, Virginia. It's unclear the time, I believe it's 1910s, 1920s. But what you're seeing here is kind of, um, it's a, either a butterfly dance or a flower dance. You'll see this kind of um, expression of growth, right? Um, and uh, these dances were meant to give uh, individuals the experience of embodying joy, transformation, right? And freedom. And I think you can kind of see that in those gestures. So those are the kinds of classes, those are the, the movements people are doing when they are attending or forming um, a Delsart club or a class um, in this period. And the Indianapolis newspapers, which is my source for most of this research, right, is regularly reporting black and white women's movements of or performances of these psychophysical exercises. These Delsart tableaus like this, um, the Grecian poses and the flower drills and dances. And this is where I bring in Dr. Porter, who after shortly after getting her medical degree and becoming um, an educator and a principal, you regularly see Lillian Thomas Fox, her friend and colleague, reporting on Dr. Porter's um, uh, 
students performing flower drills um, at their graduation programs or in their schools. Um, and so she is privileging, right, um, these exercises in the Black schools of Indianapolis. Um, I'll just uh, also another example, right? May Wright Sewell in a much more um, uh, fancy space. Uh, she not only opens a school for girls, she also um, helps build this place called the Propyleum, which is in Indianapolis. It's a center for the women's movement of this period. Um, it's a social center, but they also hold um, her, one of her students, actually, Emily Bingham, becomes a Delsart teacher and is at the Propyleum um, giving these programs of Delsart movements. And when they say plastic poses, they're referring there to Grecian statuary. Um, and so they're doing these relaxation and confidence building poses in this place. A Propyleum is also a, a, a Grecian word that means threshold. And so you can even in the in the you know the, the practices they're doing of statue posing in this space is all evoking that spirit of a new woman. So um, I've referenced just a little bit, but if we ask, you know, what did what conditions did women claim to alleviate through these psychophysical exercises? Um, this is a kind of comedic um, example of from the Boston Globe that the Delsart system imparts grace to human emotions and it's a wonderful medicine for nervous overworked persons, right? So indeed the conditions that, they're, that, they, that women are often, often saying um, are aided by these exercises are nervousness. I should have put neurasthenia up there. They are saying these exercises prevent them from getting neurasthenia. Of course, melancholy, insomnia is a really big one. There's a lot of um, promotion of these exercises to help you sleep. And then digestive disorders um, and dysmenorrhea or issues with um, you know, their periods, uh, painful cramps and things like this. These are very common. There's also prescriptions for headaches and things like that. And then of course, the biggest one though, um, also is they believe that breathing exercises that they're doing through these practices were incredibly beneficial for fortifying respiratory health. And this benefit is meaningful in light of the endemic presence of consumption and tuberculosis. And actually many of them are living through that moment in which you know, we've, the, the discovery of the tuberculosis bacteria and, um, and, the, and, and witnessing and kind of involved with the way that that is changing um, the, the response to that illness in their own communities. Um, and, you know, I think that this is actually really telling because even though we don't just, you know, we discover the bacteria for a very long time, as you know, there's not um, really, you know, antibiotic, antibiotic treatment. So for a good while, this um, is the kind of encouragement for a cure, you know, go to see your doctor, of course, but get sunlight, outdoor air, good food and rest. Um, this is a pamphlet from uh, Indiana right there in 1910. So these types of practices that they're doing in these Del Sart classes are consistent with this encouragement to breathe well and to rest. Um, but of course, um, you know, that is not uh, as accessible for everyone as, it, as, as we might imagine, right? And indeed, all of these women that I've referenced earlier had lost loved ones um, to tuberculosis. Lillian Thomas Fox's daughter, um, mother and brother died of tuberculosis. Um, uh, May Wright Sewell's two, both of her husbands died of tuberculosis. Um, there's just many examples. And so while they promoted a common repertoire of exercises for respiratory and overall health, these women also recognized and worked to alleviate the structural and ideological barriers that disproportionately harm black citizens. And I'm recognizing I'm coming up against time here. I'm gonna try to finish up here. Um, so I wanted to point out that the Flanner Guild, um, these performances are also not just helping individual health, but they are also um, building buildings, they're raising funds. So they're doing these exercises to, uh, as fundraisers to build new community centers like this, the Flanner Guild, which was a settlement home offered um, pre kind of kindergarten care and after school care for children. 
Um, the Women's um, Improvement Club, which Lillian Thomas Fox and Dr. Bueller Wright Porter head, also give entertainments to raise funds for the first Black kind of sanatorium or rest space for the Black community, right? All of these um, venues are segregated in this period of time. So their funds of entertainment or their entertainments raise funds for this fresh air camp. Um, it's also really telling that this, you know, in the white community, they're also giving performances to raise funds for white only um, rest parks. Um, this is one of the, the rehearsals for one such charity performance that is uh, meant to, to build this fresh air park. And it's, I found it really telling to see that on the very same program with the same types of flower dances and such that women in the black community are doing, that at this um, performance, uh, this charity entertainment, the program included also um, pieces called Every Race Has a Flag But the Coons and I Don't Understand Ragtime. So you have these kinds of embodiments of freedom along with uh, references to Jim Crow kind of minstrel caricatures. This maps um, with the way in which tuberculosis itself would be racialized in this period, like it germs, you're not, it's not uncommon to see kind of a black face depiction of the threat of this germ. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Of course, pervasive views about Black inferiority really are justifying unequal public health investments. Um, these are the two different YWCAs. It takes a long time to get one built for Black women. Um, and the professional journals in this period uh, for elocution and voice teaching actually are also racializing self-expression, self-knowing, relaxation, and leisure as normative and exclusive um, affirmations of whiteness in this period as well. So in one example, um, when they, on the rare occasion when they honor black um, talent, um, they will also include statements like this. Negroes have less nervous sensibilities than whites. They are not subject to nervous affections and they are comparatively insensitive to pain. This is actually perpetuating um, kind of medical theory that had been promoted throughout the 19th century um, that would also, you know, justify slavery and um, Jim Crow segregation. So even in the same article, they'll describe slavery as a school for childlike virtues, that it kept Black Americans safe from sword, pestilence, and famine. So um, in these I'm, I'm definitely running out of time, uh, but let me um, say a few more important things. Um, I want to not make a note, let you know that the tableau that they're representing here, right, that these phys psychophysical exercises also allowed them to channel emotions of past and present traumas. What they're actually depicting here is a scene called The Fate of Virginia, and it's about the death of an enslaved girl um, at, the, at the hand of her father, basically, to prevent her from being owned by a very dubious man. And this, of course, was not, um, well, it was set in, it was a scene set in ancient Greece. It was uh, a far more um, current um, in the, the historical memory of these women, many of whom would have been daughters of enslaved parents or granddaughters of enslaved individuals. So what do we make all of this? I have to wrap up, but I would say um, how, you know, how do these activities influence a historical understanding about the history of mind-body medicine? Um, I come back to Charles Rosenberg here. And if you haven't ever read this essay or seen this book, I would highly recommend it. it came out in 2007, Our Present Complaint. Um, he's speaking very much to medical professionals. Um, he, says, uh, he says in this fabulous essay, alternative to what, complementary to whom, um, he reminds us alternative medicine, this category provides an index to aspects of healthcare that largely remained unaddressed by modern medical advances. And you can certainly see that in the types of conditions that women believe they were addressing through these exercises. Another scholar of this, um, of mind body medicine says that the task really, right, is no longer to account for what we might recognize as a recent explosion or interest in complementary and alternative medicine, but rather to explain unexpected, unexpected continuities. Well, I would call them instructive continuities. There's absolutely a connection between American Delsardism and the modern culture of yoga, things we recognize there. American Delsardism is also in its time creating an influential rest cure for social activists in the Jim Crow era. 
Um, and this evidence, and this is a whole nother lecture probably, right? But I want to, to just state this, right? This evidence of what's going on with American del Sardism really requires us to reconsider the Eastern origin stories that we have about mind-body medicine. Um, and these are everywhere, you'll find them. And this was just published last year by the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Um, the definitions of yoga as purely an ancient practice um, that is something modern medicine is kind of implementing now. I think this is quite a telling definition of complementary health from this manual, that the complementary health approach is one that was developed outside of mainstream Western medicine and is used along with conventional medical care. The evidence of mind-body medicine in um, Western medicine actually uh, doesn't support this kind of um, statement. So I'm happy to answer more questions about that. More complete historical narratives can endure, um, help us illuminate enduring opportunities and challenges of implementing mind-body medicine, especially those that associate these practices primarily with Hinduism. Um, and indeed, um, right, these therapeutics are both not as new nor as ancient as they are often made out to be. This is also an instructive continuity, right? As we go deeper into these stories, we see the very subtle but very clear um, continuity of, uh, of understanding how racism influences health and wellness cultures. And this is just a screenshot from the CDC's recent um, launching of their website and initiative to help American, the American public recognize these issues more substantially. Um, of course, these continuities are also very present in robust scholarship that looks at the long histories of medical racism. Um, and I will just say uh, that another instructive continuity is to recognize, right, that the long history of social politics about mind-body therapeutics, um, there's a long history about the role of these therapeutics to affirm self-possession and reduce stress. There's also a long history of these therapeutics as a tool for um, activism, right? You may have been following this case about the, the efforts to overturn, overturn a legal banning of teaching yoga in schools. And if you're interested in more um, history about Black women's yoga and yoga, um, this is a very new book, Black Women's Yoga History. And it really helps us see that the prioritization of wellness has a long presence in activism. And um, Stephanie Evans um, writes about, this is Rosa Parks doing yoga. So if that's intri intriguing to you, I would encourage you to look up Stephanie Evans' work. I'll end um, with just this reminder, right? That rest and relaxation as a practice of health has, um, ha is very entangled with our political and economic, um, racial and gendered systems. And I'm going to end then finally with give Daisy D. Walker, who I haven't talked about nearly enough, but she's the teacher of um, Del Sarte practices in Indianapolis. When she's um, speaking to a board of charities in Indianapolis, um, her plea to them for support for their community is to remember that the people are here because of a chain of uncontrollable, uncontrollable circumstances and to treat them as if they were human beings. Um, these therapeutics and the support for the spaces where people can practice rest and relaxation um, are indeed part of that enduring project of seeing the humanity in each other. And I don't know what else <laughs> um, contributes to public health, perhaps more uh, meaningful um, than that. So with that, I will stop sharing. Um, and I apologize for going over a little bit, but would be happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Kay, for sharing about some of the history of, of Black women in mind-body medicine. I think it's um it's very interesting to have the tie-in to tuberculosis and consumption with the breathing exercises, as well as kind of finding African Americans in this practice. Um, it looks like we have time for maybe one or two questions, and so um, we're going to start going through the Q and A uh, the boxes in the, the questions in the Q and A box down below, and so we'll take a moment to let folks uh, submit any questions they have. Um, and then after that, we'll kind of go through the questions. Okay, we have one question here. Um, interesting to see how these 19th century 
ideas emphasize women's wellness and relaxation as a function of movement positions that take up space instead of things like prioritizing managing one's time. Why was this mainly aimed at women? It's a good question. Well, women are really actually the promoters. They're the innovators. Um, they are writing the manuals. They're forming the classes. Um, and it's, it, it is a response to kind of the, to the stresses they're facing. I mean, in, in the 1870s and 1880s, one of those key things is really just, it's both, um, you know, the encouragement to, to be able to move more freely throughout society and to move more confidently. And so these practices are related to that and they're associating confident self-expression with itself, um, with, with the project of health itself. They're making that connection. So um, yeah, they are talking about kind of, um, it's not, it's less, uh, there's so much to draw from comparing this culture of wellness to contemporary culture of wellness, um, because there is a consumer culture that emerges out of it, but it's not quite um, the same as what, you know, there, there's clothing that gets del called a del Sart um, shoe, for example, <laughs> like it's, there's the yoga, there's a yoga clothing of this period too. So I don't know if that answers your question, Roel, but yeah, it's women that are creating these practices and it's women that are promoting them for, for broadening um, their space in, you know, their suffragists too, many of them, they're advocating for political voice um, and for a greater presence in the kind of the cultural stage of the American public. And then we have another submission here, less of a question, more of a comment, but very interesting talk. Thank you. Though I do not have any questions, the role of CAM is of great interest to me. And you bring up interesting points about it. Well, thank you. You're welcome. It's a lot to untangle. You know, studying this history, there's, you have to encounter a lot of, um, you encounter a lot of veiled <laughs> ways. And I, I meant to put up a slide on this, but I would encourage everyone to recognize that in this modality in particular, because it's hard to measure its efficacy and it long has been hard to measure its efficacy. Origin stories do a lot of the work of efficacy. Um, and so part of the appeals to an ancient kind of um, ancientness of these practices is one of those origin stories, um, and it has a history, the way in which we even ascribe that ancientness to these practices is something to, to understand. So um, I would just I would encourage you to take that away, that origin stories are part of the way of establishing the validity of these practices. Well, uh, that seems to be all the time we have for questions okay. today. <laughs> but um, I would just like to remind folks that we will be having another uh, lecture coming this fall in November. Um, will be it'll be with Dr. Simone Kropf, uh, and she'll be talking about the history of Chagas disease, science, and health in Brazil. And that's Tuesday, November 16th at noon. Um, you can also find this recording online of today's lecture at the Bullet History of Medicine Club, and I will be dropping links in the chat. Once again, thank you everyone for coming out today and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Carrie. Great. Oh, okay. thanks. I totally ran out of time, but we've managed. <laughs> it happened. I know things here in the med school run on the like strict hour by hour sort of thing. Sometimes I, um, I, I, I internally complain because usually in the humanities, you know, things are a little bit more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but the discipline here is very, um, well, yeah, it's very disciplinary. It feels. It, it makes sense. You guys have full schedules. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, everybody so. does, but it's anyway, it's yeah. been great to have you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming. Um, I'll talk to you offline about some uh, follow up details. And sure. uh, yeah, so please be on the lookout for an email from me. Oh, th I will. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> Thanks again, Carrie. Take uh -huh. care. Bye bye. Bye, Nadia.